Hey everybody, welcome to For Food's Sake, the podcast bringing you down-to-earth dialogues about the food on your plate and its many impacts on people and the planet. My name is Matteo DeVos, and without further ado, let's talk about food. This week, I talked to Canadian best-selling author James McKinnon about eating local and the local food movement. James has won more than a dozen national and international writing awards in categories ranging from essays to science writing to travelogue. His latest book, The Once and Future World, is a national bestseller in Canada and won the U.S. Green Prize for Sustainable Literature. He's also a contributor to The New Yorker on consumer issues and ecology, and he's published in the National Geographic and the Reader's Digest, and also works in the field of interactive documentaries. Now, in this episode, we'll be discussing his best-selling book, The 100-Mile Diet, which he co-authored back in 2007, and which is widely recognized as a catalyst to the local foods movement. So the challenge that James and his partner Elisa took on was one of restricting their diet for a whole year to include only foods grown within 100 miles of their home in Vancouver. We'll be exploring the motivations, the challenges, and misconceptions surrounding local diets, and we'll reflect on how the local food movement has transformed in the last decade and what it could look like in the future. Okay, let's get started. James, thanks so much for joining us on the show. My pleasure. Um, I thought I thought we'd start off maybe instead of diving straight into the kind of locavore diet and the hundred mile diet. Thought it might be interesting for the listeners out there and for myself actually, if um, you could tell us a little bit more about your background and how you got interested in, I guess, in food in general and and spe- more specifically in in local diets. Sure. Yeah, I grew up in a suburban home in a smallish town in. British Columbia and Canada. Um, I didn't really have a particularly food-centered upbringing, but we did have a large garden that that I worked in a lot as a kid. And maybe more unusually, uh, my mom taught me to cook from a very young age. So by the time I was around 11, somewhere between 10, 11, 12-ish, I was cooking one meal a week for the family uh, alongside my brothers and my mom and my dad, we all, we all took on some of the cooking for the family. Other than that, though, uh, I was just, you know, raised in an ordinary way on an ordinary diet and uh, went on to become a, uh, a journalist. But food, I guess, just somehow stuck with me as something that struck me as interesting, particularly as I took more and more interest in environmental journalism. And, uh, at some point, uh, it evolved into the 100 mile diet experiment. Right, and so, so you, I mean, you approached food first, then from an environmental side. It wasn't a uh, a health thing. It was, it, it was. Yeah, I think most people, I think, do end up thinking about food from a health perspective. I definitely didn't. <laughs> it was, <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the real trigger for it was more uh, was was really more directly experiential. So, Elisa, my partner, and I. Uh, have this this real wind blown shack that we go to up on a river in nor- northern British Columbia right. once a year, and uh, we we ran out of food out there with a brother of mine visiting and his family, and so we just kind of pieced together a meal off the landscape there. Uh, we caught a salmon, we foraged for mushrooms. Uh, there were some old potato plants that just keep sprouting up year after year we dug those up we you know picked some wild herbs and we made this meal that we all sat around and looked at our plates and thought to ourselves you know this is the first time that any of us could remember actually knowing where everything on the plate had come from right yeah and it started this conversation about is it even possible to have that kind of experience in in a city like Vancouver where i live today with definitely you know a couple of million people. And so we brought that whole idea. We brought that idea home and 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 decided to see if it was possible. Yeah, it's it's definitely such a rarity nowadays to especially to get a I guess a hundred percent local local meal. I mean, you know, you're seeing more and more, I guess it's the trend and we can we can get into that later, but um that certain aspects definitely of your diet um can come from a um I guess a local diet. Um but definitely never a, a full you know, a full meal, you'll definitely have olive oil or, or some ingredient here or there, or, or just a bit of, you know, just a touch of salt. I mean, salt's always the the, the tough one to, <laughs> to buy locally, as I, I read in your book. Um, yeah. 
but yeah. yeah, I think that that that's it. I mean, even even your farm to table type restaurants are are only farm to table on some things, and right. and what we what we use what what we really realized though. I mean, I guess going back to what what motivated this originally, um, it wasn't health. It wasn't even really the environment. It was more this sense of disconnection from right. where our food was coming from. You know, we just realized normally we sit down and we have no idea where any of the things on our plate have come from, what processes have produced them. <clears throat> and um, secondary to that, I think, was the environmental issue of of uh, becoming more aware of the sometimes incredible distances and convoluted journeys that uh, food was traveling through to get to our plates. Right. It's definitely almost um, almost an inconvenience sometimes to to really have to, I mean, it seems that way, at least for, for certain people to th- have to think about where every single ingredient in your food comes from. But yeah, it's definitely caused the kind of, I mean, disconnect. I mean, I, I, f- I wouldn't know, you know, where half my food comes from or, 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 or who produced it or, 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 or who prepared it. Um, and that, I mean, that's something that really disturbs me. Um, and is that, I guess, what drove you, I mean, slowly towards the idea of taking on a a challenge of a hundred mile diet was it mainly just to, I guess, rediscover food, rediscover where it comes from, kind of get that relationship back, not only with other human beings, but I guess with 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 the natural world. Yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't say it was slowly though. I would say <laughs> we came back from the cabin up in northern BC and we we jumped into it pretty much right away, and you know, we jumped in with both feet. We, right. we really approached it as a thought experiment. So I think one of the misconceptions about the hundred mile diet is that, is that, uh, what we were, what we're suggesting is that everybody on earth should only eat food from within a 100 mile radius of their homes. But that isn't how we thought about it. We thought about it as suppose we draw a circle around ourselves and we try to eat, um, locally for an entire year, what will we learn? You know, what right. kind of reconnection will we have to our food? And as you said, the people and the places that produce that food, um, you know, what will we learn about our food system through that experience? That, that was the way we approached it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I can definitely relate to that because, I mean, it's obviously nowhere near as extreme, but a little over a year ago, I, I became a vegetarian and, and it's not that the, the principle, I mean, I didn't become a vegetarian for the the ethical reasons. For me, it was more the environmental ones. But I, I knew myself well enough, I guess, that what I needed to do was to go cold turkey to kind of learn the lessons and I guess learn the problems around it by experiencing it. And so, I mean, I, re- I, I read in your book, and that's, that's a statistic I keep seeing popping up, is that um, something around a, your average, I mean, I think it's fresh foods, but your average fresh food takes about 1,500 miles, I mean, I guess this is in North America, um, to travel from farm to plate. Is, is, is that true? Is, is that, am, I, am I getting the right <laughs> uh, statistics here? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that that's what the statistics, uh, that's what the st- statistics say. I think they've been updated to, to some extent, but, but in a sense, they're just getting more and more convoluted because you know, very that, as you say that that applies to uh your single ingredient food so when you buy broccoli or you buy a, a you know bag of mushrooms or something like that but most of us aren't really eating single ingredient foods most of the time you know True. <laughs> the what i really realized since the book was produced was just uh how extreme some of these distances can be i mean we tried at one point to buy uh crab that had been caught off of the coast of Washington, not far from where we live in, in Vancouver. And, but then we discovered that the crab meat, the crabs had been caught and then they had been put onto container ships and shipped to uh, Asia to have the meat removed from the shells. And then the meat was sent, put back onto a container ship and sent back. So, I mean, this thing that appeared to be a local food, local crab meat had actually traveled across the Pacific ocean and back in order for us to, to eat it. Um, multiple ingredient, uh, foods like, uh, you know, a, a prepared spaghetti sauce right. or something like that. I mean, it, it could contain journeys and journeys around the world in order to piece all those ingredients together and, and put them in a, in a jar for us to eat. Right. And I, I guess that, I mean, that kind of brings me on to the, the, the point that it's super hard, I guess, to define what a local diet is in the first place. Right. I mean, 
Like, is it 100 miles? Is it 25 miles? Um, I mean, what kind of criteria do you use? Because, I mean, what comes to mind as well is the fact that, you know, okay, even if you're eating, um, I mean, I don't know, if you're eating vegetables that were grown in Vancouver, do you take into consideration the fertilizer, the manure from the cows? Is that, you know, were the cows eating locally? And I mean, it's just, it's just, you get into this wormhole, I guess, right? I mean, it's, where do you begin or where do you end? Yeah, you can go down the rabbit hole with it for sure. So um, we decided that we just wouldn't, you know, we weren't going to, uh, we weren't going to try to address every single complication. Um, We just gave ourselves a rule of, well, was it, you know, was the, uh, was the raw product 100% produced within uh, 100 miles of our home? And we chose 100 miles almost entirely arbitrarily it's okay. you know it, it was almost uh ran- random in the sense that when we looked at what we thought of as our local region you know we looked up the fraser valley that that uh, runs up to the west of vancouver and we looked up the river valleys that run north from vancouver um and w- those those distances that we thought of as local ended up measuring um about a 100 mile radius from from our home. So we just thought, oh, well, you know, well, let's just go with that. Uh, drew a circle around it and yeah. started trying to live within that circle. But clearly, uh, you know, it, it's, it's something, there's a lot of subjectivity in the idea of local. Yeah. Uh, but for people who, you know, want to try it as an experiment, I mean, I always encourage them to, to see how local they can get. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, if anything, 100 miles, a uh... It's a nice round number, and it it sounds good as a book title too. So I mean, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that was just an afterthought. <laughs> um, well, actually, at the time, we weren't even thinking about writing a book on it. Despite the fact that we were both writers, we we took this on as a personal experiment, and, okay. and we were actually pretty embarrassed about it. You know, we were going out to. We didn't really want to tell people that we were doing this because we thought they'd think we were, you know, kind of idiots. Yeah. And and we. Uh, and we were going out to grocery stores and really like kind of shamefacedly asking mm. produce managers where the onions came from and things like this because yeah. it, it's almost hard to imagine now. But at that time, I mean, not so many years ago, uh, this was just not on the mainstream radar in any way. Right. And if you went in and, and were trying to figure out where everything came from, um, A, they wouldn't know and yeah. B, they would think that you were you were crazy. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it definitely can be like a an alienating experience, and I mean, oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. At yeah. that time, certainly it was. Yeah, it's, it's so strange now to see that it's you know that it there's kind of a, a quality of hipness to it. Yeah, at this definitely. Point. Yeah. <laughs> and to think back to that time and think that it was, you know, it was just absolutely alien, and and you know, and some people responded fairly, um, you know, fairly. In a in an irritated manner, right? <laughs> <laughs> to put it to put it mildly, yeah, yeah. Um, that brings me on, I guess, to um, to just the experience itself. At times, it must have been very alienating, very frustrating. I mean, I saw in the book that you know, it, it, at times, it must have been very difficult. Um, just about this idea of it being an adventure and, and forcing you out of your comfort zone. I mean, what what can you tell us about the journey, the discovery? the the foods you rediscovered i mean just tell me about the experience of what you remember and what kind of stood out well i guess what stood out first was the way that you know 95 percent of the grocery store just suddenly seemed to vanish you know for in terms of what once we applied this rule to ourselves we would walk into these grocery stores that we think of as worlds of plenty right and and there was in some cases just absolutely nothing there for us uh, so that was that was the first lesson we learned was just that there was remarkably little local food available to us through conventional system, conventional food systems that we were yeah. using, and uh, and then you know the second thing of course we noticed is that we had <laughs> we had optimistically picked the first day of spring as <laughs> the day to launch this this uh, experiment and. You know, in Canada, the first day of spring is, you know, we, we had this <laughs> naive idea of it being, you know, the first day of spring comes along and, and you know, fully grown carrots kind of shoot out of the ground <laughs> and are ready to go. And and uh, 
And of course, it's not like that, you know. So right. it was. We also immediately confronted this this reality that that we had such uh, a poor grasp of how the food system actually worked, even at the local scale. Um, and then, so we struggled, you know, for a yeah. while. We certainly the first couple of months, um, you know, we called called it the war vegetable months because everything we <laughs> ate seemed to be coming out of a you know some World War Two. Uh, diary, you know, it was all just cabbage and potatoes and beets and and um, and then a lot of borscht. Slowly, a lot of borscht. A lot of borscht. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, we had a really great recipe for borscht. But um, it's uh, you know, since after that, it it really got a lot better. It just became more and more uh, fascinating. The food that we were encountering was. Um, you know, it was amazing. We were just, you know, we're starting to discover the the incredible quality of food that you can get when you're working off your local landscape. Uh, the diversity. Uh, I mean, it really did start to feel like a an adventure, and not right. of the not of the uh, extreme suffering variety, but rather, you know, the kind of wandering into an exotic new landscape and and discovering what's there. Was it just a matter of, I mean, just driving out to local farms and just, or reaching out to, 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 to I mean, was it the internet? How, how did you, I mean, how did you go from discovering that your local grocery so stores had, you know, nothing you could eat to having this kind of uh, new abundance, I guess, this totally new diet emerge? Yeah, really, I think it was a lot of of uh, just getting out to farms. Uh, Farmers markets. There weren't a lot of farmers markets in Vancouver at that time, but it was certainly a, an important access point for us. Um, but yeah, getting out to the farms, meeting farmers, uh, uh, and meeting farmers from all kinds of different backgrounds in order because we right. we really wanted to get the most diverse diet we could get. Um, digging into the history of the place we lived in and finding out what used to be grown here and you know what isn't today uh grain being a really prominent example and fruit um this area was was uh there there was an abundance of different varieties of grain grown here 100 years ago there yeah. were it was a major orcharding area um but as as all of the different food regions specialized it lost a lot of it lost a lot of that yeah. uh crop diversity so Looking into those things, looking into um, wild foods, uh, you know, there's, we just had to do a lot of, of detective work and, yeah. and in that old detective style, you know, wear out a lot of shoe leather, <laughs> going to different places to, to find things to eat. Yeah, I guess one of, the, one of the indirect consequences of that must have been just this enormous new network of relationships with with farmers and with the natural world i mean could you could you maybe talk a little bit more about that about the kind of rediscovering your your neighborhood i mean you'd you'd been living there as if 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 i'm not wrong already five years right in vancouver but this must have been a yeah. whole new vancouver yeah it definitely was a whole new vancouver i mean um we just really didn't have any sense of of you know what what was growing here what foods were produced in what seasons um, we just really didn't know, we just didn't know what was out there. So when we started going out and buying honey, uh, I, you know, that was one of our earliest, uh, explorations because honey didn't depend so much on, on the season. Right. Um, you know, getting out there and meeting this honey producer. And, and I think it was, you know, one of the first times that I remember, uh, actually meeting a person who produced a food that I was going to, <laughs> that was going yeah. to be important to me and seeing the land that it came from and hearing the story of the bees. And actually, you know, he actually suited up and took us out and showed us the oh, bees wow. and the hives. And, and, uh, yeah, we weren't suited up. So. <laughs> <laughs> you had a lot of um, faith in him. Yeah. Or in um, the bees. <laughs> and, and, and I especially remember, um, uh, you know, discovering that there were multiple different kinds of honey, you know, like I, I, I had not known that at that time. So, you know, he, here he is saying, well, the, this honey's from blueberry flowers and this one's from raspberry flowers and this one's from buckwheat flowers, which is a very strong, uh, almost bitter tasting honey. 
um, you know, these, this is from wild flowers yeah. and so on. And, and realizing, hey, you know, there's, there's a lot of diversity in this product, honey, that I've always just thought of as, you know, this kind of thing that all tastes sugary sweet that i get from the yeah. get from the grocery store wasn't wasn't there even a, a pumpkin one i think i remember there was yeah, yeah there was a pumpkin honey that <laughs> yeah pumpkin flower honey which became one of our favorites um That's that just incredible. had yeah it just had this very faint uh hint of pumpkin flavor and was otherwise kind of a a, a nice um dark honey um yeah i mean we just really it just really w- woke us up um in general, and there's all there's a lot of foods like that. I mean, we met a, a seed grower and and uh, organic grower mm. on an island uh, in the Pacific, not far from from Vancouver here, and and uh, he had over he's grown over 300 varieties of tomato. So, oh, wow. you know, <laughs> didn't even know there, there were, there were that many. <laughs> no, and, and I'm sure there are many, many more than that. So. Yeah. Um, this that was one of the biggest surprises to us and i mean people often talk about one of the one of the questions we got most was uh isn't this boring isn't right. it repetitive yeah. isn't it limited uh and i'm looking at people saying you know what we we can pick from 300 varieties of tomatoes what how many do you yeah. get at the grocery store you know yeah. five if you're lucky um you know that that was the kind of uh, and that goes for almost, you know, almost anything you can imagine. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that 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 was my first impression, at least before before picking up the book or before kind of, you know, seriously considering trying this myself was, you know, I don't want to be eating, you know, potatoes all winter. I mean, I think that's the kind of misconception that people have, right? It's this, um, you're, you're familiar with your own diet. And, and then you I mean, because your diet consists of a lot of, I guess, vegetables that come from all around the world, avocados, and then fruits, strawberries that, you know, you just can't get in the winter in a, in a, in a, in a Northern European or Northern American climate. And so then I think a lot of people just kind of shy away from it or, or, or brush it off because they see it as, you know, spending six months of the year just eating potatoes and eggs. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, I think most people... Um, there's some research that that shows this as well, but you know, most people uh, who are eating from what I would call the global supermarket mm-hmm. are they're typically cycling through you know somewhere between ten and twenty different meals that they make uh, with a really consistent set of ingredients, and uh, you know maybe they change it up with different sauces, but but you know the base products are are all pretty much the same. Right. What we found, and they're the same all through the year. So what we found eating locally was that our the things that we were eating were constantly changing. I mean, they didn't just change with the seasons. They changed every couple of weeks according right. to what was available. And one thing would, would disappear from the market and something else would come, you know, would, would come on the market. Mm. Um, so we were eating, uh, what we were eating was changing more over the year than it ever had before. And the variety of things that we were eating was was wider than it right. had ever been before because we were um, we were looking for you know everything that we could get off the local landscape and and of course there's a lot of things that you know they're just for various reasons either they they aren't produced in enough volume yeah or their season is very very short or they're too fragile yeah. to be sold at the grocery store there are a lot of things that you don't get in the in the ordinary commercial food system that are available at the local scale. Right. And, and I mean, nutritionally as well, right? I think there's a common misconception here that, you know, if you're sticking to a local diet, you're not going to get all the, the, the modern nutrients you need. I mean, you're not going to get the, the nuts and the seeds. And, and I mean, I guess that's kind of misunderstood too, right, about local diets. I mean, you're eating foods at peak ripeness. There must be a lot of benefits there too. Yeah, I mean, I, I... The <laughs> at this point the that the idea that it might not be as healthy is right. You know, it, it honestly just sounds yeah. ridiculous to me. Yeah. I mean, it's a, I have I've never eaten uh, a healthier diet. I'm sure than than I did once I started the 100 mile diet and have continued to eat locally. Um, I mean, it's one of the key reasons that Elise and I do continue to eat locally is because. Uh, is because we feel better eating this right. food 
than we ever did before. In fact, one of the things that I remember most was at the end of the 100 mile year, we, we, you know, we were like, hooray, you know, let's go, let's go out to some restaurants that we haven't yeah. eaten at for a long time and, you know, eat some, you know, eat some stuff that we've, that we've been missing. Yeah. And the restaurant food tasted so bland um, and so uh, packed with fillers and yeah. so lacking in liveliness that we, you know, we were so disappointed and, and, and just kind of rejected it yeah. um, and went back to the, the diet that we had been, you know, that we had developed for ourselves. That's fascinating. Your, your taste buds adopt and your body craves, you know, you know, I guess you don't know what you're missing out on if you're not committed to a, a diet like that. Yeah, I mean, we we to this day, it's it's difficult for us to find restaurants that we want to eat in because mm. the the food experience is so much less than it is just cooking at home. Yeah, with, I mean, even just cooking something simple at home is going to be more flavorful. Is going to feel better for our bodies than um, you know than than even going to fine dining restaurants. Um, it's it's made it very difficult, you know, because we, we really just have to find restaurants that have a same, the same kind of mentality as we do and the yeah. same kind of approach to food in order for us to really enjoy it because our, our, palate, our palate has changed. Yeah. That doesn't mean that I can't occasionally just, you know, <laughs> throw down at a diner <laughs> <Yeah>. and, uh, <laughs> and enjoy, you know, a greasy omelet on white toast. Yeah. I can do that, but, but that's not, you know, that's not the day-to-day -day way that I, that I choose to eat. Yeah, I, I, I've got a little confession. I ate a, a massive vegetarian burger before this uh <laughs> before this interview started. I was <laughs> thought I'd I thought I'd you know, I'd uh I'd put that out there. So Yeah, but I mean it's I think the other thing is that people people think of these you know the the locavore way of eating as somehow precious or or you know, or lacking in those sorts of comfort foods and so on. But, you know, it doesn't really, it doesn't need to be. It can yeah. be, uh, you can eat, you know, <laughs> you can make yourself a a big sloppy Joe sandwich or biscuits and gravy or, you know, mac and cheese or, you know, yeah. all kinds of different things. You can, you can do all of those sorts of things yeah. with local food. It's not, uh, you know, it, there's not, there doesn't, I can understand why it has acquired this reputation as being kind of an elite, um, uh, you know, endeavor. Yeah. yeah, an elite sort of fine dining type of approach to eating. But I, you know, when people confront me with that, I just say, well, you know, is that how you perceive the way your grandparents ate or your great grandparents? Right. Yeah. You know, no, it's just an ordinary way to eat food. Yeah, but I mean, is it? Is it? Do you think it's feasible for for everyone with the kind of I mean, the modern day nine to five jobs to still be able to to cook this or, or to, to live this type of lifestyle. I mean, maybe not as extreme as the 100 mile diet, but to to really adopt, a, I guess, the majority of their diet coming from 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 local sources. Do you think it's do you think it's doable? Well, there's two ways I'd answer that, I guess. One is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't have a four hour work day. I mean, yeah, I, I work, yeah. uh, both Elisa and I work, work more than eight hours a day. Yeah. Uh, neither one of us is rich. We rent a two bedroom apartment on the ground floor in, in Vancouver. Uh, we have a, you know, 15 year old car. Yeah. Um, we're, you know, we're not, we're not super well to do people and, and we make a go of it in terms of both time and money. Yeah. A lot of people do. I mean, a lot of most of the people I know who are most committed to eating local food are not well-to-do people. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, though, that I would say about it is that I don't think of eating locally in the same way that I think of, say, you know, vegetarianism or veganism, where we think of having to make a break from. Uh, the previous way of eating, you know, you, if you go vegetarian, you, you don't go halfway. You, you stop yeah. eating meat yeah. to become a vegetarian. That's the definition of the job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, local eating isn't like that. You know, local eating can be uh, as fast or as slow a process as, as people want it to be. And I, you know, I say as a guiding rule, if it's fun, 
if you're enjoying the process, if it feels adventurous and new, mm-hmm. um, then, you know, great, perfect. If it feels overwhelming, if it feels like a hair shirt environmental project, uh, if you're suffering, yeah. if you're hungry all the time, then, you know, uh, ease up a little bit. <laughs> you know, it, try harder. <laughs> yeah, what, what we find is that, um, what we find is that it, once people start down the path towards local eating, they tend to do more and more and more of it. Yeah. They may not get to the point where they're eating every single ingredient from within 100 miles. Mm. Um, but, you know, typically if you start with apples, you'll move on to potatoes, you'll move on to your salad greens, you'll start looking for local milk or cheese or what have you, and, and people just keep adding things on. They can, they can do it at whatever pace feels comfortable to them. Yeah. On the other hand, there is just something really fun and interesting about doing a really strict 100-mile diet experiment just as a way to, to learn, yeah. as a crash course, really, in, in, uh, in global versus local food systems and what's available on your local landscape. There's, there's kind of nothing better than doing it in the crash course style, but not everybody's going to have the time or, or the energy to do that. Yeah. And, and do you think it's doable? I mean, you, you mentioned vegetarians and vegans. If, if, if you're a full on vegan, for example, or even a vegetarian, actually, I mean, I know, and I know, I know you and, and, and Elisa, you, you relied a lot on, on, on dairy and eggs as a source of nutrition, right? As a source of protein. But do mm-hmm. you think it's, do you think you would have been able to do it as a vegetarian? It would have been pretty tough to do it as a strict vegetarian at that time. Um, now it would not be difficult. Um, in in because of the popularity of the local food movement and its various successes, uh, it, it's now entirely feasible. I think to be a vegetarian or a vegan on a local food diet in a lot of places, and Vancouver is certainly one of those. You can you can get all your legumes, you can get um, you know all the all the beans and and nuts and you know these sorts of things that you that you would want. But one other thing that that can happen and and did happen to Elisa and myself when we started we were vegetarians uh you know not extremely strict ones but we were we were avoiding eating uh meat of any kind uh, other than fish and what we found through that we were doing that really strictly for environmental reasons and a lot of people these days are choosing vegetarianism as a rational response to the environmental problems associated with industrial farming yeah myself but, included yeah exactly and and what we've found what we found through the local eating process is that uh we met farmers whose practices and whose standard of care for their animals were sufficient for us to uh to eat meat again so we actually went from being vegetarians to being omnivores again mm. through the process of of local eating and um, and, you know, I'm quite comfortable with the environmental consequences of the amount of meat that I eat and the way that it's produced. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, I, I, sh- I very much share your, your point there. I mean, I told myself when I became a vegetarian, so, I mean, it was in, in October, the year before last, so a little over a year ago, um, that I would start kind of cold turkey because I know myself well enough that I need to kind of break first. Um, but that, you know, slowly I want to reintroduce it when I know exactly where my meat's coming from, when I'm satisfied with the standards. When And I'm, I think a lot of that just comes back to it being, you know, local and, and knowing the farmer and kind of having that relationship and, and being comfortable knowing where your food comes from and, and, and how it's been treated. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it, for, for me, it's the same, um, you know, with, with, with vegetables. I mean, I, I, I find it really interesting how... I mean, organic. You know, um, I'm very much for organic for all for all its 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 health benefits and all its environmental benefits. But there's definitely an element that we tend to forget. I think, which is that the food workers that are working, the the, the people that are you know uh, picking your tomatoes, aren't necessarily always you know um, you know treated the best. They're often undocumented migrants who are being exploited for their labor, and that's kind of I think where a lot of people they 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 tend to miss that that human aspect almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's one of the biggest arguments for eating in a local food system is that local food systems are more transparent. If you yeah. develop that concern, if you start to think to yourself, who's producing my food and under what circumstances, 
uh, if you know if I develop that concern, uh, I can go out and and investigate it. I can drive out to the farm and and take a look. <laughs> you know, yeah. I can I can I can uh, uh, I can buttonhole one of the farm workers and ask them what their working conditions are like. I can go to events where these sorts of issues are being discussed by the people who are affected. Um, that's not the case if I'm buying my my uh, peaches from California or my cucumbers from Peru. Right. There's there's an argument as well that I've 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 come across, and I'd love to hear your opinion on this. Which is that, and I think you mentioned in your book as well towards the end that um, I mean, eating local can be counterproductive from an environmental perspective because um, you know if you've taken extreme example. Avocados being grown in, in 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 California, being shipped on mass to Europe um, per unit might be kind of might have a a smaller carbon footprint than you know five avocados grow, grown in northern Sweden in a greenhouse. Um, I mean, what's your take yeah. on that? I mean, I've taken the most ridiculous, <laughs> extreme, simplistic argument, but there's there must be some truth in that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like like all things, taken yeah. to taken to extremes, the idea of local eating can be can be absurd, right? I mean, if 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 I'm saying I want to eat locally, but I want to eat products that can only be grown locally with extraordinary inputs of chemicals <laughs> and and energy, yeah. then, you know, then it's it's interesting because we never really stop to think hey we might have to address that argument because <laughs> we never thought anybody would make an argument that bizarre yeah but uh, but you know that 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 is what it came to people started saying well you know wouldn't it be better to to uh to just buy uh, chocolate that had been grown in the open air in in Colombia, rather than try to grow it in a greenhouse with enormous inputs of fossil fuels somewhere in you know, the Fraser Valley outside of Vancouver. And of course that's true. Yeah. Uh, but the other alternative is not to eat chocolate or to make chocolate one of the handful of global products that you, uh, that you choose to eat. Um, the one example, you know, I recall being the study that kind of broke all of this wide open was a study that compared greenhouse grown winter tomatoes in yeah. the UK with field grown winter tomatoes uh, shipped in from Spain, and it found yeah. that the carbon footprint of the tomatoes from Spain was lower. Uh, my response is, I don't eat winter fresh tomatoes in the winter. <laughs> uh, I eat dried tomatoes in the winter, or I eat tomatoes that were canned uh, in the autumn in the winter. So, you know, the question, most of the time I find that those questions, um, they they spring from a lack of understanding about the philosophy that people develop towards eating when they eat right. locally. Yeah. They're just, they're great media headlines, but, um, and academically, I guess they're interesting to explore, but they kind of miss the wider point of what the local movement's about. And, and the fact that it's, it's very much linked to seasonality too. I think people always tend to separate the two, but they're very much interlinked. Yeah. People, I mean, another one that was raised was the idea that you have all of these small farms and each one of them has to load a truck and drive it to the farmer's market. And then everybody drives to the, to the farmer's market and picks up their product. And, you know, th that, uh, dispersal of, of transport has a really large footprint in itself. And, but, and there's, there's truth to that as well. But the fact is that within local systems, if you identify that as a problem, it's quite easy to streamline those sorts of, right. those sorts of issues. It's, it, you know, there is no way to, uh, to miraculously remove the the carbon from um, from the journey of a, a load of apples from New Zealand to to Canada, or at least you know it, it's very very difficult to do so. Yeah. Um, but trying to do that at a local scale uh, is possible. For example, uh, in an area in British Columbia called the Kootenays, that's where a whole bunch of communities are connected by lakes. People developed a real interest in local eating mm. and they decided we're going to produce, uh, we're going to start producing grain at a local scale uh, because they, part of their, their concern sprang from environmental issues. They ultimately decided we're going to do a lot of this grain farming using horses. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to deliver the grain to the communities by sale. So they ended up with a, 
you know, an absolutely carbon minimal local grain system through a couple of small innovations and, you know, and a degree of effort. Um, those are the sorts of things that are highly possible yeah. at a local scale and virtually impossible at a global scale. Oh, that's really interesting. I never, yeah, I never saw it from that, that perspective, I guess. Um, I now want to move on to the way in which you think, I mean, the locavore diet and, and, and the local movement has evolved. Um, I mean, I think it's 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 the 10 year anniversary soon of your book, right? I mean, it's yeah, yeah. yeah it is. <laughs> so, I mean, I know that book helped catalyze the local movement. Um, I mean, where do you think local leading is today? I mean, I know we touched upon it a little, but how do you think it's going to evolve in the future? Well, I mean, local food systems continue to evolve. Um, the first thing I guess I'd say is that I'm, you know, I'm just absolutely astonished at how far it has come in the last 10 years. I mean, if if you time traveled me back to 2007 and and I was looking around at that time at where global food system or where food systems were going, um, I would never have imagined the scale of changes that we've seen towards local food systems. Uh, and in this region, you know, this region is obviously the one I know best. But the the example I I jump to is. You know, it took us, I don't remember what, six or eight months to find one um, grain grower in our region when we were on the 100-mile diet. Yeah. And there are now, um, you know, there's now multiple grain growers. Coastal grain growing has been revived to the point that you can buy a 100-mile loaf of bread. You can buy a 100-mile beer. Um, these sorts of That's things were... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, th these are dramatic changes on the landscape itself. So, you know, that that's kind of where I want to start with it. Mm. Um, I, but I think the, the problem, the real problem facing the local food movement right now is that demand has proved really, really strong, um, but supply has been a challenge. And supply has been a challenge because there just has not been the support and policy and governance um, for local food systems mm. you know they're they're happy to have they're happy to slap a locally grown sticker on some food and and try to sell it at a premium to people in farmers markets and high end restaurants and so on and so forth but they're not you know there hasn't been a real commitment to uh to help people build local food systems that can you know that are really designed to feed the most people possible um you know to to put the strongest amount of local food supply into local food systems yeah. that i think is you know that's that's the big challenge today and and of course you know the reason for that is that uh the industrial food system is very entrenched it's politically powerful yeah. and, and it's subsidized it's yeah. Those, you know strongly subsidized it's it's difficult to make those changes and and unfortunately, one result of that is that it has made, it has driven up prices. As a, you know, one of my brothers said to me at one point, um, referring to the 100, <laughs> the, the popularity of the 100 mile diet, he said, thanks for making onions $8 a pound, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's, it's true. I mean, you go down to the farmer's market and a lot of the food is, is, uh, is much more expensive than it might be um, at the grocery store. And that is because we subsidize the food, you know, the, the, the kind of growing that produces food for, for the global supermarket. And we offer next to no support for right. the smaller scale farming that happens at the local level. But I mean, and yet, you, yeah. obviously people want it. Yeah. But I, I mean, I, I sense that you you remain quite optimistic, right? I mean, is, is that just because of how, sar how far you've seen it go in the last 10 years? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think I am optimistic, and I'm optimistic for the reason you gave, which is that I've seen what can happen when enough people are driving change through their either their activist efforts or their consumer demands, or you know, in this case, uh, both in a nice combination. Um, so I am optimistic, but but I do think that. Uh, recreating the demand for local food was always going to be the easy part yeah. um you know reinventing the the food system so that it it uh 
it's more local focused and less globally centered, you know, that's, that was always going to be the hard part. So that, that, that is something that, um, there are, there are a lot, um, there are many more committed local food activists today than there were in 2007 when we wrote the book. Um, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely optimistic that, that they're going to, uh, keep driving the change on the supply side as well. Well, that's great to hear. I mean, I, I'm, I've, as I told you before we started the interview, um, as part of kind of side project I'm doing with For Food's Sake, uh, called Learn by Doing, um, I have to commit. I mean, I want to. It's not a, it's, not, it's an <laughs> obligation I, I put on myself, uh, to at least, uh, a week of eating completely, in this case, a, a local 100 mile diet. So, I'm really excited to see how that's going to go. Um, I mean, I my first impression was that it was a little bit overwhelming, and 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 those are some of the issues I think we discussed earlier. Um, also, I mean, I, I just to, to to sidetrack a little bit. I mean, reading your book, you sound like a an amazing cook. Um, so, what do you what do you say? I guess to um, and Elise is very lucky. <laughs> what do you say to um, I guess the people out there who. I guess like myself, um, who want to try this, but maybe don't feel so, I mean, we're not fantastic cooks. Let's put it that way. Is it, is it, yeah. is it, is it, is it a way, I guess, as well of, of, of learning how to cook? Because I mean, it's, I mean, I do cook, but it's usually yeah. with the kind of, at least I don't have the constraints when I go to the supermarket. Now I feel like I'll be experimenting with foods I've never heard of, which on the one hand is exciting, but on the other hand, with a, with a nine to five full-time job, it, it, it sounds a little stressful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do think uh, that is one of the things that as a as a strict experiment, a 100 mile diet reveals is is how much we've lost, um, how much we've lost in terms of the cultural knowledge around cooking and how to cook and food, food preservation, um, food preparation, the selection of food, all of those sorts of things. Um, and in, in that one, um, I think because I learned to cook when I was, you know, when I was very young, it's, it's actually just hard for me to, to put myself into the, into a beginner's mind on it. But yeah. I think what my suggestion would be is, uh, is to find somebody who can help you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is, this yeah. is one of the things we don't do enough of in, <laughs> in society today, right, is, is find the people who have those skills. And, and, and get a little bit of help for a little bit of guidance and, yeah. and some instruction because cooking is not um, the good news on with cooking with local ingredients is that the food, the things you prepare can be very simply done with yeah. very few, uh, very few ingredients and, and the results will still be fantastic because yeah. the food quality, the ingredient quality is so high. I mean, often, often the biggest difference between the fine dining restaurant and the, uh, the other restaurants is that the fine dining restaurants use very high quality ingredients, and and that's what right. that's what you'll be eating on a local food diet. So, uh, but if you know, if you're overwhelmed by the idea of cooking, then then I think uh, add to your adventure the experience of of speaking to you know a parent or an aunt or an uncle or. Um, or a, a friend or a yeah. grandparent, um, mm. you know, somebody in your broader community who can, who can give you a little bit of guidance. And, and there's, you know, there's a lot of pleasure in that for, for both sides in that exchange. Mm. You know, part of eating locally, I think, right at the essence of it is that you, you build a little bit bigger community around yeah. the way you eat. You're building a community with the people who produce your food. Um, you're, and and this is another way to do it is to, you know, is to uh, get some guidance from people who know what they're doing. Yeah, and I, I definitely I definitely like the point of, of of not doing it alone. I mean, to reach out to people, but maybe even I mean, like you did yourself um, with Elisa's, if you do it together with a with a group with a community, um, mm -hmm. can definitely definitely should be a community experience, and definitely should be something that doesn't you know doesn't alienate, but rather helps you reach out to people. Yeah, and you start to realize why that was so much the case in the past, right? I mean, it, right. to make uh, a few dozen uh, pierogies on your own is is a lot of work, and you know it's lonely and it feels like a chore. Mm -hmm. If you do it with a group of people in a bottle of vodka, it, uh, <laughs> it goes by much 
local vodka, which yeah, you can actually ex- get. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, then, uh, yeah, the, you know, the work goes by much more quickly. And you can see why, why those sorts of traditions emerged in the past. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. Well, I guess that this is a, a call out to all listeners there. If you're a, if you're a good cook, I, I need you. <laughs> um, <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to add? Is there also a, a website that people that are interested in, in, in the work that you're doing that they could turn to or, or any last advice you could give people trying the, the 100 mile diet? Sure. I mean, if people are interested in my work, I'm I'm really not uh, focused so much on food uh, at this point. I've kind of moved on to other issues in my writing and my journalism. But if people are interested in that, then I, you know, they can track me down at jbmckinnon.com. The last thing I guess I'd I'd like to say is just, uh, is just that, you know, Elisa and I had, the way we eat was changed forever by the 100 mile diet. Um, we never stopped eating locally. We did stop eating every ingredient from within 100 miles. We eat today probably about 85% locally. Um, and that's very comfortable for us. And it's, it's, uh, you know, it's become something that's, that's second nature and very easy for us to do. Yeah. Um, and that's the, but the reason that we stuck with it ultimately was not the environmental issues. It was not, uh, it was not health. It was not a lot of the things that conventionally drive people towards these issues in the first place. Mm-hmm. In the end, it circles back to the, the way we started, which was you know, realizing that we had this disconnection from where our food was produced. The reason we stick with it today is because we've undergone that process of reconnection, right? Yeah. And we have this, now we feel this strong uh, connection to the, the landscape around us. We pay attention to the seasons more. We have personal relationships with some of the people who produce our food. Uh, and we are reconnected to the food itself you know to the quality and the diversity of food that's available at the local scale um so in the end it was this kind of full circle from disconnection to connection and um and that became you know that was what brought the journey together for us and and made us want to to stick with it wow yeah that really makes me motivated to to start that's uh that's a beautiful yeah, well, way of I hope putting you enjoy it. it. Yeah, I think I think I will. Well, James, thanks so much for joining us today and uh and uh, I'll let you know when I when I start my 100-mile diet. Good. Well, good luck with it and and thanks very much for uh for this conversation today. If you're interested in the 100-mile diet and local eating, if you're maybe even interested in trying the diet for yourself, uh in our next episode, I'll be talking about my progress of taking on the 100-mile diet as part of a 7-day challenge. This special episode will be the first in a series of Learn by Doing mini podcasts. The Learn by Doing initiative is all about taking action. It's about implementing sustainable habits and actions that our guests talk about. It's about practicing what we preach. And of course, about sharing my experience, my tips and tricks for sustainable eating with all of you. As always, guys, if you like this week's episode, you can support it by subscribing to the podcast via iTunes. Uh, You can also leave a a review and a rating there that really goes a long way into helping the podcast. You can, of course, share it with friends and family, people that you think might be interested in the local diet or in other episodes. Uh, You can, of course, also go to the website at forfoodsake.me. You can like our Facebook page and you can follow us on Twitter. That is all for now, guys. Thanks a lot and see you soon.